Earlier we read from 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. I'd like you to have that page open in your Bibles if you have one, please. Uh, But also Romans and chapter 8 toward the end of that chapter. So Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15. I would have loved to have read the whole of 1 Corinthians and chapter 15, but we will refer to some of that as we go. But I want to begin by putting it back in the context of the verses that we've had as our anchor point over the last few weeks in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 to 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And then over in 1 Corinthians and chapter 15, look at verse 49. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Let's pray once more. Lord God, these words are exciting. They're thrilling. They're overwhelming. We need your help, gracious spirit, that we may understand them and feel them that we might enjoy what is spoken here because it is ours. But, O Lord, unless you give it and unless by faith we grasp it, it remains beyond us. So, O God, don't only give it to us, but teach us what it is to have it. Grant it and give the happy and holy sense of it. Lord, may our faith increase. May our hope rise even now. And may our love increase as those loved in Christ be ever warmer and purer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've been studying out salvation. We've taken the framework of Romans chapter 8, that God has predestined a people, and he has predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son. And having predestined them, that is, having chosen them in Christ, having appointed them beforehand for these mercies, then he has called them. He's called them through the gospel. He's called them by his truth. And at work in his people's hearts by his spirit, they have been converted. They have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. God has worked in their hearts, faith, and repentance and in turning from their sins and laying hold upon Jesus Christ they have come into union with the son and now belonging to Jesus Christ God says that whom he predestined those he also called and whom he called these he also justified that now that they are in Christ Jesus, they are washed in his blood, they are clothed in his righteousness, and on that basis, God declares that they are righteous in his sight, and he accepts us in his beloved Son. So accepted, we are now called sons of God. We are declared to be adopted, brought in to the very family of God. As such, we are sanctified. That means we're set apart to God, and God by his Spirit is at work in us to form Christ in our hearts and in our lives. And with that reality taking place in us, and with the promises and the prospects of God held out before us, we are then persevering. We are straining forwards. And we saw that last Lord's Day from Philippians and chapter 3, that every Christian... Everybody who is knowing God in Christ and thinking clearly as a true believer is stretching forwards to lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has laid hold upon us. And what is that goal? What is that prize? It is the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Because whom God predestined, these he also called. Whom God called, these he also justified. And whom God justified, these he also glorified. The end point of all this, the terminus, the final destination, is likeness to Jesus Christ, sharing the glory that belongs to him. We have been, if Christians, chosen in Jesus Christ and now united to him, and everything from that point is moving toward the consummation, the final blooming or blossoming of God's purposes. And over the course, especially of the last few sermons in this brief series, we've begun to, to see some of the continuity and some of the overlap and some of the development. And as a preacher, it's, it's hard at times because you can, you can see what's coming. It, it's, 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 it's not remotely like this, but you, know, you think of someone who knows the punchline of a joke. And before they've even started telling it, they're, they're laughing to themselves. They know what's coming. They're all primed for, for what happens at the end. And as we've been working our way through some of these verses, we've begun to have that sense that, that something is coming at the end. When we talked about adoption, we've talked about the fact that we do not know what we shall be yet, but that we do know that when we see him, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We've, in Philippians chapter 3, we've talked about the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul reminded us there that that is the, the fact that Christ is going to appear from heaven and he will make us like himself. So from the very beginning, and it's important that we grasp this, rooted in the sovereign purposes of a saving God is the intention that we shall come to be with him like Jesus Christ. And everything that we've been looking at has been like a surfing of the wave that's carrying us toward this particular end, all toward the certainty of glorification at the resurrection when Jesus Christ returns. And though we'll come back to it toward the end, I just want you to hear the note of certainty in Romans 8 and verse 30. Whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. It hasn't happened yet. But so sure, so certain, so fixed is this that Paul can talk about it as if it has. He says, if God has predestined you, you are as good as glorified. If God has called you, you are as good as glorified. If God has justified you, then you must be glorified. So that there is no possibility in the links of this chain being broken. This process will not come to a, a premature end. As Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 1 of his letter to them, that what God has begun, that good work, he will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. So every time you're reading these things, every time you're, you're working your way, as you read your Bibles for yourselves, you should be looking for these notes, looking for this progress, looking for this development, and seeing how so often the apostles weaving these things together, whether it's Paul or John or Peter, we've seen the consistency of the Word of God in holding before us this whole process, this whole reality, and then being able and willing to dive in and to see some of its individual elements this then is what Jesus Christ has laid hold of his people for Christ has grabbed us in his gospel so that we might be with him where he is he's prayed for it father I want them to be with me and everything in this is carrying us toward that goal and it's what we are pressing towards we're not being dragged, kicking and screaming toward the glory which is to come. If we're Christians, our whole humanity has already has the Spirit of God at work in us. Our hearts have been transformed. Our appetites are now heavenward. And we are reaching towards that for which Jesus Christ has laid hold upon us. And that's what brings us to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. 
Again, there are many portions of God's word that we, we could turn to. Uh, there's a temptation to preach on this just for today for about four or five hours because there is so much detail here. There's so much that we could bring in from other portions of God's word. I, I would, maybe, maybe at some point we will look at these things in more detail because although it is not yet known what we shall be, that doesn't mean we're ignorant. Christ has instructed us with regard to what lies ahead for his people and the different portions of God's word that shed light upon this reality mean that you, brothers and sisters, if you are believers in Jesus Christ, you can do what Paul tells the Thessalonians to do. You can comfort one another with these words. There's nothing so unknown about our future as God's people that we are left distressed or confused. We're not looking into white space. We're not looking into just noise. It's not a vacuum out there with, with nothing certain and substantial. It's glorious. It's real. It's beautiful. It's the glorification that God's people anticipate. What then is, first of all, the glorious expectation of God's people? What is the glorious expectation of God's people? It's in verse 49. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, there are two images here, two likenesses, a shared nature and appearance. The first of them is the man of dust. He's referred to in the verses before this as the first Adam and the first man, the man of dust. And everybody here this morning is in Adam's image. That's why you're tired. It's why you're sick. It's why your eyes don't work and your brain feels fuzzy. It's why you're distracted. It's why you find it hard to keep your eyes on the Bible. It's why you find it difficult to pray. It's why by nature... You are dead in trespasses and sins. It's why apart from Christ you have no real appetite for God. It's why things are wrong in us and with us, both spiritually and physically. This is the image of the first Adam, the first man, the man of dust. It's your present natural body and it means that in all of us there is death. But as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, who is the heavenly man? Well, the first man was of the earth, verse 47, made of death, dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. That means, Christian, that you are going to be like Jesus Christ that you will share the very nature of his glorious humanity, that when people look at you, they will see you in that day with the glory that belongs to the risen Jesus Christ. And if you go back a little bit further to verse 42, you'll see some of the contrasts. This body is sown in corruption. That's the earthly man. It is raised in incorruption. That's the heavenly man. This body is sown in dishonour. It's put into the grave and you see its, its misery and its emptiness. But it is raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Incorruption and power and glory belong to the image of the heavenly man. And that's the nature that we will have. And that's the reality that we will enjoy. Now notice the curious language in verse 44. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. Now that confuses some people. Because we think of this as being natural and, and physical. That makes sense. And then there's spiritual, which is immaterial. That's, that's the contrast we normally make, isn't it? The, the physical and the spiritual. Now, what does the apostle mean when he talks about the natural and the spiritual when he's referring to bodies, to touchable, 
handleable, tangible things. Well, he means this. You've got this natural body that belongs to this present age. And then there is, in the resurrection, a spiritual body. And it might be most helpful if you thought of this as having a capital S. A spiritual body. That is a body that in the resurrection is formed and fashioned in a distinct way by the operations of the Holy Spirit so that it might be like the resurrection body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You think of him bursting from the grave. You think of him coming forth. You think of the qualities of his body after the resurrection and some of those curiosities that make you wonder, what kind of body is this? Now, it's one that the Lord Jesus can say, touch me. See that I'm real. Come on, Thomas, put your fingers into the nail prints in these physical hands. Put your hand into the spear mark in this physical side. Let me eat and drink with you. It is as real as any of the bodies that we have now, but it is a spiritual body. It is formed and fashioned by the work of the third person of the Holy Trinity so that it is entirely like the real physical body of the Lord Jesus after he rose from the grave. Don't think of it as there's a physical body and then there's a spiritual thing. It's this horrible idea of heaven, of of these disembodied spirits floating around. That's not a great expectation. To be with Christ in our spirits, that's far better than what we have presently. But it's not the end point. The spirits of the just men made perfect, they're yearning for what still lies ahead. They want their bodies back. Remember what the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians. I don't want to be unclothed. I want to be further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up in life. When we come to the grave, when we come to death, there's a temporary putting off of this fallen body. And it's sown in in corruption, and it's sown in dishonour, and it's sown in weakness. But you'll put it back on, and it will be transformed. And it will be a body that is fit for your sinless soul. It will be a body that is constituted for you to enjoy the presence of God with Jesus Christ in the new heavens and the new earth, a body that will reflect the final crowning accomplishments of the Holy Spirit in your redeemed humanity. And that's what Christians are looking forward to. That's our glorious expectation. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. But then there's a difficult obstruction now we've got a problem verse 50 now this i say brothers that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does corruption inherit incorruption so paul says now you've got a problem because that's where we're going and that's what we want but this is where we are and this is what we've got at the moment We've got these flesh and blood bodies, these natural bodies that are subject to sin and to death and will be laid in the grave. And it is not possible for the bodies that we now have in their present form to inherit the kingdom of God. We're not yet ready to enter into the state of glory in our physicality. The spirit can enjoy everlasting life. We already possess the eternal life, the life of the age which is to come. That's why Paul can say to the Philippians that when I die, I'm going to depart and be with Christ. My soul is safe and I will be with him. But my body won't be there yet. And that's a problem. I've got this corruption And it cannot enter in to incorruption. It's not fit for it. It's not proper that it should go in. I cannot live in the new heavens and the new earth as I now am. It's where I'm going. It's where I belong. But I'm not fit for it just yet. I cannot enjoy the renewed cosmos unless and until I am made ready for it my friends there's a happiness that god has designed for us 
There's a glory, there's a beauty, there's a sweetness, there's a joyfulness that the Lord God intends for us. And the problem is that we are not ready for it just yet. What will it be like? The tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And that hasn't happened yet. So I have a body that weeps. I have a body that feels pain. I have a body that is subject to sorrow and to crying. I have a body that reflects the fact that I have been made in the image of the man of dust and have not yet been brought to the point where I fully bear the image of the heavenly man. And so I've got this promise that we're going to bear the image of the heavenly man. And I've got this problem that I cannot inherit what lies ahead in my current form. So what needs to happen? There is, my friends, a coming transformation. And this is where we'll spend the rest of our time. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and so therefore my beloved brothers be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord okay so we don't have much time to talk about the fact that this is going to happen to us and we are going to have to scoot across some of it and make references to other places. But let's do what we can, at least to get a sense of where the Christian is heading. First of all, Paul tells us a mystery. He tells us a mystery. What he means by this is, you wouldn't know this unless God had made it known. This is beyond human wisdom. This is beyond human reason. This is revelation. This is God saying there is something so great, so beautiful, so magnificent, so thoroughly supernatural that by yourself you never would have begun to grasp this. And I'm asking you now, Christians, do not let the fact that it is a glorious mystery undermine your faith. Surrender now to the wisdom and the power and the declaration of God Almighty. Believe what God has made known. Because if you wrestle with this, I just can't get my head around it. That's a good place to be. But you need to get your heart around it. You need to get your hands around it. You need to understand what God has done and is doing. This is not something that is made up. This is not Disney or Marvel or whatever else it may be. This is not fiction or fantasy. This is God's saving purpose. And you find it through the Old Testament. You find the hints of it in the beginning. You find it when Job is saying that these eyes are going to see my God. Where do you get that, Job? God has made it known to him. You see it in, even in Joseph saying, you take my bones up with you when you go from this land because this isn't everything. What's he hinting at? He knows the exodus is coming, but there's an image or a picture there of the fact that this isn't the end for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Thessalonians 4, Philippians chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, read these portions for yourself and fit together the glorious picture this is why i'm trying to keep it tight and why i'd love to do this for hours at a time what is the mystery that paul makes known what is it that we're looking forward to what does god have in view for us that we would never have thought could be it is a change we shall all be changed there's going to be a transformation brothers and sisters 
And every one of God's people is going to be constituted differently to the way we now are. Now, what does Paul tell us here about this transformation? First of all, it is inclusive. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking here to Christians, and he's saying that though not every Christian shall sleep, and it's that beautiful, gentle Christian language for death, if you're in Christ Jesus, we won't all sleep. Now, that may not mean that none of us here sleep, but there will come a point when Christ returns and there will still be believers on the earth, and they won't have slept in the, in the sleep of death. But whether or not some are sleeping, all shall be changed. Every believer is going to be subject to this transformation. Some of us will face physical death. Unless Jesus Christ comes first, all of us here will. But not all believers, because some will be alive when Christ returns. So some of us, considered as the whole body of Christ's people in every time and place, some of us will die. We will sleep. But all of us will be changed, regardless of whether or not we are in our graves. It is an inclusive change. And it is sudden. It is in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. We know this language, don't we? The twinkling of an eye, the, the, the blink. It's, it's instantaneous. And, and again, I think sometimes we're so conditioned by the culture that we live in. Think of the transformations that occur. What should we go? Should we, let's do Beauty and the Beast, shall we? You seen the Disney thing? And the Beast, finally, I can't remember. I, I'll be honest, I haven't watched it. But there's, I've, I've seen the clip, and there's, like, there's a flower. I know there's a flower, and there's maybe a declaration of undying love, something like that. There may be a kiss. But anyway, there's a point when this big, ugly beast, and what happens? Easy to understand with me up here, I know. But, so, so he sort of comes up, and if I remember rightly, there's this kind of, and everything's in slow motion, and he's sort of spinning around, and light begins blowing out of him in every place, and then he kind of slumps to the ground. He's some kind of feeble, good-looking fellow. Is that it? Is it going to be like a Disney cartoon? <laughs> Done. That's divine power, my friends. That's glory to come. Yeah. You won't even see it happening. You won't be looking at yourself or other people going, what in the world is happening to those men? And no, when Christ returns in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, the trumpet will sound and a transformation will occur. And there are portions of God's word, 1 Thessalonians 4, where there's sequence. And you understand that this happens first, and then this happens, and that's all true. But there's something that is momentary about this. There's something that is instantaneous. This is phenomenal power. Did it take time when God at the beginning said, let there be light? Was there this sort of gradual coalescing? Did these things take thousands and thousands of years while God sat back and said, well, maybe in due course that'll turn into something out of the soup? Or did God speak let there be light, and there was light. God speaks, and things come to pass in that moment. And when Christ returns, and he rolls up this old cosmos like a battered and worn-out garment, he is going to make all things new by the word of his power. And when he speaks, you will be changed. The trumpet sounds. The archangel declares the coming of Jesus Christ. And at his coming... In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now again, there's that sequence. There's that Thessalonian moment. What happens? Well, first of all, how do you have first in a moment? I don't know, but there's sequence here. First of all, the dead rise from their graves, and they go, and we are swept up together with them to meet God, to meet Christ in the air. So there's this instantaneous rising up from the graves and from the earth, and you think of it across the whole sweep of the earth, every battlefield, every sea, every graveyard. Out of them all come the people of God, and those who are not yet sleeping, they are carried up with them. And in that moment, a transformation occurs. Everyone who belongs to Christ suddenly 
And there's definite time here. It is at the last trumpet. There is a day of resurrection. My friends, God has appointed this day. He already knows when it is. This is not vague. This is not hopeful in the sense that the world hopes that it might be sunny after a period of rain. God has appointed a day on which Christ shall judge the world. God has appointed a day on which we shall be glorified. God has the moment in mind when we shall be made like his son, Jesus Christ, and brought into his glory. All shall be changed. This is the appointed hour, and it is necessary. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass... Must, must, when, then. Again, you get the sense of logic. You get the sense of truth carrying forward in these particular steps. And I I want you to think of the Apostle Paul at this point. I want you to, to understand he doesn't sit at a desk to write. That he's writing with a scribe. Someone is sitting to write and Paul is walking around prayerfully thinking about what he's going to say. And you know how, he's, how we understand him to have been. He talks to the Corinthians about his body and how it's been battered and broken. This is a man who's been beaten with rods. This is a man who's been put in the stocks. This is a man whose bones and whose hands and whose flesh bear the marks of his sufferings. And Paul is there and he's writing. He's, I say striding, he's probably shuffling back and forth in that broken body of his. And he's saying, and this corruption must put on incorruption. And this mortality must put on immortality. Brothers and sisters, that's how Paul wants you to think about this. He wants you to think about yourself. He wants you to touch yourself, to feel, to say, yet this is me. And this is the body that's going to be transformed. This is the humanity that's going to be changed. And then when that's happened, then shall be brought to pass that is saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And the language he uses, he's picking up some of what he said earlier. This corruptible is going to put on incorruption. It will not be any longer possible for any degeneration to occur in my humanity. Nothing else is ever going to go wrong with me. I'll never need, I won't need glasses. I won't have aches and pains. And I'll never need them. Because what I am will be incorruptible. And immortality, I will no longer be liable to death. If I say, can you imagine that? The answer is probably no. (laughs) You have to believe it because death is so real and so present in this world. Can you imagine not having to think about dying? Paul says you need to believe that one day you won't. That you will no longer have to think about the grave. That you will no longer have any prospect of your body and your soul being pulled apart. There will no longer be any possibility of any kind of degeneration or destruction in your flesh. It's this humanity. You get the immediacy of it. This corruption. This body. This is the body that's going to put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. (coughs) And when that has happened, all things are ready. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written... Death is swallowed up in victory. This then is a final transformation. This is the moment of absolute and enduring triumph. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The grave has been overcome. Paul is quoting here, we think, more or less from Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 8, maybe drawing also on Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. But he's saying that that's the moment when the power of sin and death and the grave are finally broken. Now, you've probably heard these words read at the side of a grave. 
some point in your life. I don't think that's altogether wrong, but I do think it's a touch premature. Because standing at the side of the graves of our fathers or our mothers or our brothers or our sisters or our friends, there's the sting. Here's the sorrow. Here's the pain. But it's not the end. It's not the end because that corruption must put on incorruption if they're a Christian. That mortal must put on immortality and then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, death, where is your victory? When the grave is denuded of all God's people, when every grave, when every sea, when every battlefield, when every morgue gives up those who belong to Jesus Christ. That's the moment of your exaltation. Where is your victory now, boasting grave? Where is your power now? Where is your strength now? For Christ's people have come forth incorruptible, glorious, honourable, excellent in their majesty. The power of sin is broken. The sting of death is sin. That's what makes death horrible, because it's from sin. What's the strength of sin? The law. That's what exposes our transgressions. But now we have in Christ, we have these, this maw of death muzzled, and we have these chains that have been smashed. It is the moment of his evident defeat. Death no longer has the triumph, no longer has the power. Why is this? Well, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, you hear the language that's so immediate. We have been given the victory. God gives us now and always the victory over death in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes you read through Paul's letters and you think, what is he trying to say here? You think of Romans chapter 4, 5 and 6, or you think of Galatians chapter 3. One commentator says, this is Paul's summary of Romans 4 to 6 and Galatians 3 in one sentence. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. That's what Paul is saying. Sin kills us, and it's where death gets its power. The law exposes sin in us because it shows us what sin is and, and our fallen nature is such that when we are told don't, I say, I want it. And when we're told do, our fallen nature says, why must I? Paul says, it won't be like that anymore. Sin puts the venom in death, but Christ's death has overcome sin. The law stirs up and exposes our sin. But Christ has obeyed the law for us. And the curse which the broken law deserves, that curse has fallen not on us, but upon him. Sin has been conquered. Death has been defeated. By Christ. When he dies, he wins. And when he rises, his triumph is revealed and declared. When the angel rolls the stone away so that the, the witnesses can look into the empty tomb, it is the revelation of the fact that sin cannot overcome us, that death cannot hold us, and that the law no longer condemns us. We are united to Jesus Christ, and so we are entering into glory. God has overcome for us in his Son, Jesus Christ. And why? In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, remember, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is that Holy Spirit? He is the guarantee of our inheritance. He's the down payment. You already have him. And you have him until the redemption of the purchased possession. Not until the time when he goes away at the time when the down payment is fully made up, at the time when the present operations of the Holy Spirit in your humanity come to their full and final expression, the redemption of the purchased possession, what Paul calls it to the Romans in chapter 8, the day of adoption, 
And it is all to the praise of the glory of his grace. You will share your glory, not because you have conquered, but because he has conquered and you have conquered in him. You have walked in his footsteps. You have followed in his way. You have known his grace. You have enjoyed his strength. You have tasted his power. You have been reaching out for that for which Christ has laid hold upon you. And this is the day when you get a hold. The goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that, my friends, is compelling. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. What makes our hands to hang down? What makes our knees feeble and weak? What robs us of spiritual energy? What stops us working and serving? What makes us miserable and difficult? It is our absence of hope. I mean, why bother? I mean, honestly, if this is as good as it gets, why bother? If Christ isn't risen from the dead, we're of all men the most miserable. That's where Paul begins in this sequence in Romans, in 1 Corinthians 15. You remember how he started? If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? That was the Corinthian problem. They'd lost sight of these things. You're listening to people who say there's nothing to look forward to. There's no prospect. Maybe it's already happened or, or it just won't happen. If there's no resurrection of the dead, though, Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty. Your faith is empty. Yes, and we're false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. So what happens if you lose sight of the resurrection? What happens if the glory to come grows dim and distant in your eyes? You start to fade. You start to fail. You begin to give up. You play with despair. Paul says, brothers and sisters, there's something worth looking for. And there's something worth working for. And there's something that holds you up and that carries you forwards. Because Christ Jesus is coming. The Lord is going to return. He's going to come with the shout of the angels. He's going to come with the archangel's trumpet. And the dead in Christ will be raised. And we who are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up together with them. And thus we shall be forever with the Lord. So are you suffering? Are you striving? Are you struggling? Is it painful? Is it difficult? Are you mocked and scorned and disdained as your saviour was before you? Look to what lies ahead. Remember what is coming. And therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Not even, well, I suppose it'll turn out sooner or later to be something better than this. Remember... The illustration from last week, I am so close to the finishing line, I cannot help running with all my might. Paul says, because this is what lies ahead, run. Because this is what you're looking forward to, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, run with endurance the race that is set before you. What did he have to do? He had to despise the shame. He had to endure the cross. But now he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And from there, my friends, he is working in us and he is working for us. He is pleading on our behalf. He is making intercession for us that we might be saved to the uttermost. And because of that, because of this certainty, because of this hope and because of this joy and because of this prospect, what do we do? We run, we strive, we serve. We pour out all the strength and energy of these feeble, corruptible, mortal frames because it is worth glorifying God here that we may be glorified together with Christ in the age which is to come.
Paul says, if you're following Jesus Christ, everything becomes worthwhile. Is there anything vain, pointless or empty? The sermons that you preach where it seems that no one listens, the witness that you bear where no one seems to pay any attention, the care that you lavish for which people seem to be so unthankful, the efforts that you make, the money that you give, and it seems to just accomplish very little, the, the churches that you try and plant and they get battered and bruised, the Christians who seem to suffer and struggle. What's the point? Is, is there any value in this? Paul says, when Christ returns and you see every one of his people in glory with him, then you'll say every striving, every struggling, every moment of service was gloriously worthwhile. Samuel Rutherford, speaking as a pastor and a preacher, wrote to his congregation when he was in prison. He said, my heaven will be two heavens to me. I'll be there and I'll see you there for whom I have poured out my strength. Who will you be there with? Who will make your heaven a double heaven to you? Who will you have loved? Who will you have served? Who will you have spoken to? Who will you have encouraged? Who will you have drawn alongside? Who will you have helped to run to the finishing line? The glory to come makes everything that a Christian is and does worthwhile. And unless we have our eyes fixed upon the glory to come, we will be flaky. We will be feeble. We will be full of emptiness and despair. But whom God predestined, these he also called. And whom God called, these he also justified. And whom God justified, these he also glorified. Brothers and sisters, this is a done deal. Amen. This is coming. I don't know when, but I know that it is coming. I cannot tell you the day or the hour any more than Christ in his humanity could when he was here upon earth. But God knows the moment. God knows the second when the trumpet will sound. And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, every one of God's people here will be changed. Will you be there, changed into the glory of Christ on that day? See, there's a resurrection of the just. And there's a resurrection of the unjust. God's people will be constituted and fitted for the glory which is to come. And if you are not a Christian, you will be constituted and fitted for the punishment that awaits. That is a fearful prospect. You think now there is pain. And there's misery. And there's sorrow. And there's tears. The resurrection body of the unrighteous will be a fearful, fearful thing to behold. You do not want to be amongst those who are cast into outer darkness, into the fire that is not quenched, there with the worm who ever gnaws upon the soul, where there is weeping, where there is gnashing of teeth where there is only the blackness of darkness forever and your body and soul suffer all eternity, the torments that your sinful thoughts and words and deeds deserve. And this is what God holds out in Christ. Come to me. Call upon me. Trust me. Take me. For this is salvation. And what God begins, God will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. Are you weak? He is strong. Are you needy? He is mighty. Are you empty? He is full. Are you confused? He is wise. Are you struggling? He is gracious. Are you face down? He can lift you up and carry you on. Are you trusting him? And are you following him? My friends, he will have the preeminence. He will bring you to glory. He will stand in the presence of his father and he will say, here am I and the children that you have given me. 
This is the Christ who rejoices over the travail, the labour of his soul. He sees it and he is satisfied. Does he see it now? Yes, he does. With every one who is brought into his kingdom. With every one who is walking in his ways. When will, if I can put it this way, when will the broadest smile break out upon the face of the glorified Jesus? When he brings all his ransomed people into the presence of his God and Father. He says we're all here. And we'll never, never leave. And every tear is wiped away. And every sorrow and every pain is obliterated. And glory dawns. And the sun of righteousness shines in the world which is to come. A new heavens and a new earth. This creation transformed. And this corruption, this mortal, transformed for the new creation. Forever and forever with Christ in the glory which is to come. Because Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, that first Adam, that first man, that man of dust, all die, even so in Christ, that second man, that last Adam, that heavenly man, so shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. There's the pattern. And there's the pledge. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. And then, brothers and sisters, then the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy, that is death. Then it will be destroyed. For he has put all things under his feet. But when God says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself, in his mediatorial glory, with us, will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And that is what will make everything worthwhile. Amen.